Good morning, everyone. This is Joe Abadi. Thank you for joining us today at Vintage Motocross Q&A. Today's show is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors, Preston Petty Products, the legend continues, Vinco, keep the ride going, Motion Pro for all your specialized tools, controls, and cable needs, Nightmare Racing, the best reproduction Kawasaki plastic on the planet, AMS Oil, the first in synthetic oil since 1973, Full Circle Racing, your one-stop shop for spokes, rims, lacing, truing, and hub restoration. And a special sponsor today that I'd like to welcome, Fortuna Sausage Company. Fine Italian delicacies delivered right to your door. As you've heard me talk this week or seen my post here on Facebook, my guest this morning is going to be Paul Stainard in just a moment. But first, we've got a special guest coming in, and I'm about to get him on the phone. It is the one and only Preston Petty. I spoke to Preston Petty about 9 o'clock this morning. I reminded him that I'd be calling him at 11. And uh, I'm hoping... Hello? Joe. Preston. Thank you for calling. Preston, can you hear, Preston, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. How about you? Can you hear me okay? I am, Preston. Just uh, let me remind you to... Speak a little slowly and keep the phone close to your mouth so we can hear you really clearly, okay? You bet you. Preston, you must be very excited that the uh, Preston Petty brand has been brought back to the forefront again by Paul Stainard. Uh, tell me this, though. When did the first Preston Petty Fender actually roll off the production line? When did all that happen? Well, the very first one, uh, I think, was about January 1970. Oh. Uh, uh, that they were the very first ones were not very good because I did not understand different types of plastic that there are mm -hmm. available. I didn't. I knew how to build a, uh, do 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 the design, the die cavity machine, but I didn't understand plastics or injection molding or that. So. Uh, it took me, uh, the first six months was a serious problem trying to figure out what type of material to use. I didn't know, there was, I didn't you know, have hardly any idea of what types of plastics there were. I uh, was uneducated. Uh, the first, first plastic defenders that we made, uh, well, they have, uh, well, it's called a high impact polystyrene. And so, uh, well, it worked okay uh, a little bit, but uh, as soon as I uh, got done with my first day's worth of riding, I went down to the corner car wash to, uh, to clean the bike, and I used coke on the, on the thing, and it just dissolved the, the polystyrene, like, you know, like putting gasoline in a, in a coffee. Sure. A styrofoam cup, it just disintegrated it. And so I took... It took me, oh, we had about almost two years, the uh, first two years, to get isolated on the right kind of material, material to use. And, and it was in earlier days of plastics, and, um, you know, both in the plastics industry themselves, the plastics have been proved a whole bunch since the early 70s. So, Preston, yeah. what, what were some of the plastics that you had in your possession that you tried? Were there, were there buckets or w what did you use? Well, we, uh, actually a friend of mine, uh, we had found a paint bucket that seemed to withstand pretty good. And on the bottom of the can, it said container, container industry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, heck, they're over, they're over here in Glendale, there was. And I got hold of them and uh, it turned out it was, uh, the van there uh, had a couple of sons that were like motorcycle riding, and so they uh, uh, had an interest in it. And, and, and he showed me what kind of material to, to use. In fact, they ran for the mold for, for a while, but they didn't. They didn't need the money. They were doing it as a favor uh -huh. for me to be going. So on the weekends we would 
uh, they, they were shut down their container manufacturing, their bucket manufacturing thing, and putting my injection mold and run some tenders and, and keep it going. And then once sales took off, because they didn't want to, they didn't want to spend their weekend making fenders. They, they didn't want to go riding. Sure. They didn't lose money. So I uh, had to finally got sales up good enough. I could afford my own injection molding machine. And that's when we moved to Oregon. So we could concentrate on a dedicated machine just to make fenders. And by that time, we got pretty well ironed out by then. I remember getting plastics. Uh, from the plastic from Shell Chemical down in Houston, and I had I had a bad bad run one time, um, and I got the engineer up and flew up from from Houston, Texas, and he uh, he looked at it and, and I, I said, look at the difference, and I had some of the old material and the new one. He said, oh yeah, I'm sure so. It's a different. He said. But there's no, uh, the engineers, if they saw what you were doing with each, with each fenders, they would, they would say, I was never designed to do that. So we're, uh, <laughs> they'd be impressed. And they're, they're not going to support you at all. So I was, uh, uh in, in trying to prove with you so far that what their design criteria was. Anyhow, so we had to, we had to rope around quite a bit. Preston, how, let me ask you then, how, how long were the first batch of fenders made in the bucket factory? Well, it was probably in the uh, first uh, six months of 1970. Oh, okay. And, and back then, you had a column, I believe, in Dirt Bike Magazine. So was that really your primary source of advertising, or did you do things in cycle news? Where did you advertise the fenders at the beginning? I didn't, didn't do much, actually. Uh, word of mouth was mostly uh, to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't. I didn't realize about advertising until later on. I was too focused on trying to crank out a, a, a superior offender and not advertising until I got there. It wasn't until Oregon that we really started advertising. Yeah, on it. But the first first couple of years was just. Word of mouth and, and trying to get it perfected with the right material and the right production and the best production facility we could produce. And that took me a couple of years. I didn't, you know, I didn't have any financing. I had to, uh, <laughs> and I had to improvise. Back, I remember I didn't even Dan Ives. Before I moved to Oregon, I was in Dan Ives and I wanted to buy an injection molding machine to make these things. And I had a hard time getting somebody from Cincinnati, Millicon, or somebody who did it, to even stop by and see me. And, uh, and the salesman finally didn't come in. And uh, he, he left me some information there, and he's going to leave the door. And I said, you're not leaving this door without me <laughs> giving you an order for a machine. And that was it. So I kind of forced him into selling because I had no... He didn't understand that uh, we weren't even in the plastic. We didn't even have any machine really to speak of. No plastic injection motor machine. So that was kind of alien. Do you, you know, do you remember, Preston, the cost of that machine at that time? About $150,000. 150000 in 1970? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I, I, $59,000 on that one. The more expensive one was 150000 Wow. Yeah, $50. So I had the, since fortunately, I didn't have that kind of money, but Cincinnati Millicron did their own financing, so I just found out what the monthly payment would be and sent them off a check for each, each month. Mm -hmm. And then uh, since the sales started going, we, uh, uh, but maybe once we got the first machine, Sales were really taking off. So I didn't put in an order. You know, back in those days, you, took, you put in an order for a machine. And, and they're all custom made. It took, from the time you put in an order for a machine, it took you six months before you finally got the machine. 
Wow. I'm like, like today where they have everything in stock. Then they have the vacant custom. So it was expensive and slow. Now, Preston, you were an avid racer in those, ba in those days back then as well. Do you recall maybe one of the first days you went to the track after you started producing fenders and realized how many people were actually using them? Oh, I was impressed. Boy, I was surprised. I didn't realize the world was so big. There were so many people doing it. But, uh, you know, I, I figured, I think, as I've said before, but the, uh, I, originally I thought if I sold 2,000 in the total run of the, of the bold defenders would, would be exceeding, that would be uh, me, my expectation. Hmm. But then, by uh, by the middle seventy, we were selling two thousand a day worldwide. So it was a much bigger world than I thought. <laughs> yeah, I, I I guess it was. Now, the the first fenders that you made, they were what front front uh, Baja fenders or mutters? What were they called back then? Back then, they were we we did not have a name for the fender when we only had one fender. Okay, yeah, but they were called the Baja fenders. That's correct. We the and what what was the second product that you produced at that time? Oh, we produced a, a rear fender, which wasn't very good, and uh, then we uh, produced the uh, headlight number plate, and that took off really good. That's the oval number plate with the headlight. Sure. Like you got there. You know, back in those days, the uh, <clears throat> AMA. Uh, required flat, the flat surface amount the, the numbers are, where, you know, later on their life, they permitted contoured surfaces. You can put numbers on it any way you want, but back then we had the flat surface. So that's what popped the flat design of the headlight number plate. Right. Now, Pro Preston, what was, what was the process for uh, registering your trademark, was it difficult to do back then, and did you do it early on? Well, I remember my dad, my dad was a Beverly Hills attorney, and he had a friend uh, that had a, had a, uh, uh, an office, he was a patent attorney, he had an office on the top floor of a building in downtown Los Angeles, uh, so I went to visit him, and uh, uh, the guy Said, yeah, he said, you can. He said, obviously, this is how I pay for this, this office. And all I he said, yeah, the bottom, bottom line, the company that has the best product at the best price is going to win. And, uh, I, I take your money from that, but I, I, I hesitate to do it. This content, I'm getting the best product at the best price. And so I focused on that. didn't get any patch until we... Uh, uh, until we moved to Oregon, and then started getting bad. But uh, worldwide, uh, we, did, we didn't have any to start with. And, just, and the guy just, and he was being honest with me. Yeah. He just concentrate on, the, on the, getting, getting the best product at the best price, and you'll win. <laughs> don't, don't worry about the patents to start with. But, you know, we didn't have anybody... Uh, the business was so small back then that we didn't have any competition, so to speak. So just focus on building the best product we could at the best price. Well, <laughs> and I took, for example, uh, I, I, you know, I didn't want any, uh, anybody to be uh, uh, hurt by the fact I selected uh, Newburgh, Oregon to produce product. I thought products, my products should be uh, deadly. Where I build them is my selection. Uh, and if the people in Australia or Europe should, be, should not be penalized trade wise for our, uh, my selection on Newburgh, Oregon to produce them. So I made the price the same on my products worldwide, uh, no matter whether we, we paid the shipping. So, Nobody would have to pay, none of our would have to pay for uh, that guy. That guy. So you kept, the, you kept the price the same across the board, around the world, and you paid shipping too? That's correct. Wow. That's correct. 
How, how long were you in the building in Oregon, Preston, and, and how many square feet was that? Fortunately, I was on a better, better choice. When I first saw this building, it was a 40,000 square foot building. I thought, man, that's much more than I need. So uh, I just rent out the, the extra room because the price was cheap. It was like $59,000 with a whale siding and a lot of room in the old concrete box building. And I thought, boy, that would be great for me. And, uh, and like in two years, we were, we were already out of space. We, were, we used every square. We never did stuff out of any of it. So fortunately, that was a good, good growth. You know, we weren't into you know, growth wise, but having that big building. And, and from there, where did you go? Well, then uh, after, after that, I, I sold to Scott. Sold, sold the Preston Enterprise. Scott, the original Scott USA, uh -huh. they they, uh, they went they went bankrupt, and, uh, and, and they deteriorated from there on. Right. Uh, put it that way. Well, Preston, your your story is a very very interesting one. So many people want to know about it, and I would really like to dedicate uh, a whole show to you in the very near future. Um, I, I, I have your number and your email. I'll get back in touch with you this week and we'll arrange something. And it may, it may be best, Preston, uh, for me to maybe come down and see you and maybe we could record this uh, in the near future. But I'll stay in touch and I, I think we need a really good quality camera and good quality sound to capture your story. And if it takes me uh, you know, if it takes me a while or a day or if you're getting tired, uh, I'll spend a day down there in Southern California and we'll, we'll get together and we'll get the whole story down, okay? Okay, pal. Thank you. Preston, thank you Goodbye. so much for taking the time to speak to me. I will be in touch with you. You betcha. Thanks, Goodbye. Preston. You betcha. Bye-bye. The legendary Preston Petty. It was very, very difficult to... Uh, want to stop speaking to him. I have had Preston on the phone several times and uh, due to his age and he's got a little bit of difficulty breathing at times, it, it, isn't always, it isn't always optimum. But today you really got to hear uh, a, pretty good, uh, a pretty good message from Preston about his early days in, in Oregon and how the Preston Petty product began. Right now I'm going to have to put in a call into my next guest, who is Paul Standard, he's going to be joining us in just a moment, and we'll be hearing more about uh, his ventures with Strictly Hodaka, with Preston Petty, and so much more. Hello. Paul? Yes. Good morning, Joe Abadi. Hey, Joe. Good morning. I'm listening to you right now. All right. I got it all shut off. How are you, Joe? I'm, I'm doing real well. And, uh, you know, things got a little, well, let's put it this way. Generally, I call the person I'm interviewing and I tell them, okay, you just be quiet for a second while I give the introduction and then we'll get into, uh, we'll get into your interview. But uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think, uh, how do you say it? You need no introduction, Paul Standard. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean I'm a legend in my own mind? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, you know, it, it's, it, 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 it had something to do with, uh, you know what, Paul? Paul, let me read it because I really worked hard on this, you know? So I, I really want to read the introduction. My guest, okay. this, my guest this morning began reproducing parts for the Hodaka brand after rediscovering vintage bikes in 1987. He was a food purveyor by trade, but soon found himself submerged once again in the brand he loved as a kid. For over 20 years, his company, Strictly Hodaka, supplied enthusiasts with everything needed to keep the Super Rats, Wombats, Dirt Sports, Road Toads, and Thunder Dogs on the trail. He's credited with actually saving the name Hodaka. In 2016, after several years of development, he brought back to the forefront a vintage motocross product we all enjoyed as kids in the 1970s, Preston Petty Products. 
It's my privilege to have as my guest this morning, Mr. Paul Standard. Paul, how was that? Uh, Joe, that was that was humbling. It was fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I, I didn't I didn't save the Hodaka brand or bring it back. It was a team effort. But uh, but thank you, Joe. We're, That's we're gonna, very very kind. Yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about that and. Uh, because, you know, it is the Internet, and I do my research there, and you can go to three different places and read three different stories about something. And um, I, I did read that, and I said, well, this is pretty interesting. He saved the Hodaka brand. i got to ask him about this. But let's go back to when you were a wee child. Where did your journey begin with motorcycles, Paul? Um, well, I had mini bikes. I, I grew up in Westport, Connecticut, mm -hmm. and... Um I had mini bikes as a kid, and we always had land behind the house. And and where I live now in Vermont was property that my uh, my grandfather had owned. And uh, so every weekend, pretty much, I would come to Vermont with my grandfather, and and we'd uh, we'd work or or fish, or I'd get a chance to ride motorcycles. My first real mini cycle, in a sense, was a, a, a Trail 50, Honda Trail 50. Mm -hmm. Then I moved up to a CT 70. I, I wish that I had had an SL 70 or an SL 100, but. But I got the CT70, and uh, and that was pretty much through my youth. Um, never raced. I uh, didn't do any of that. I just was kind of a woods rider, just enjoying the, my time out in the woods and and uh, and time on the bike. Did, yeah, it was great. Do you, do you have friends up there that had similar bikes, and you guys would go riding in the woods together, stuff like that? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, we I had friends in Connecticut. We'd go riding in the woods and, and trails and down near the reservoirs and and uh, you know trails that we weren't supposed to be on, but but as kids. <laughs> Back then, it was okay. Sure. And uh, and yeah, and the camaraderie and the friendship and riding bikes and never really got into chasing each other through the woods. It's just kind of seeing what was really out there and getting out and, and getting back home safe. Right. Now, did, did did you attend any motocross races as a kid? Was there was there that moment uh, where you said, you know, this is something I'm going to really make a part of my life? Not not necessarily. I did attend motocross races. We had closest closest to me at the time was. Uh, was races in Fishkill, Fishkill, New York, and I remember going there and watching the races. Loved it. I thought it was great. I just couldn't understand how these guys on these bikes could go over jumps and go so fast uh, on on these on these tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, you know, being on a CT70, there's no way that uh, that that was possible. And I and I loved it. Um, it it was good, but kind of got to into a working life um, and uh, got married, raised a family, and. What got me back into bikes, Joe, was in 1986. Mm -hmm. We had our restaurant and business in Rhode Island, and we were, both my wife and I were working long, hard hours. And uh, 1986, our son Chris was, was uh, six years old, and I bought a little uh, uh, Honda ZR50 for him to ride, and I needed to get a bike, you know, for myself so we could go riding together. And uh, I had a Hodaka as a kid also, uh, Dirt Squirt. But uh, in 1986, I, I answered an ad in, in a paper where a woman had a, a Hodaka Wombat for sale. She was asking $400 for it. And uh, when I went to go get the bike, and we talked to her about the bike. It was a gorgeous bike. I still have it today. Uh, and I told her that I was buying the bike to go riding with my son. Mm -hmm. She gave me the bike. <laughs> she just said, here, and, um, which was so cool. And, uh, and, you know, it just kind of uh, makes you appreciate people and, and the kindness. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people are... Uh have a soft spot for that father and son relationship, especially when it comes to uh, dirt bikes and stuff like that. I've been there myself a few times where I've been selling stuff or doing things and a father and son shows up and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a great way to, to really bond with kids. So, so your, your love for the Hodaka brand as a kid, that started right, right after the SL70 thing? Um, yes. I mean, I, ha I had a dirt squirt, and, um, and what inevitably had happened, my father was a, a pretty tough guy. He was an ex-Marine in, in Korea, and, um, you know, and what he said, he meant. And uh, uh, I was always warned. We had 15 acres behind our house in Westport, Connecticut mm -hmm. at the time. And I was warned, uh, you know, you don't ride the bike on the road. And if you get c caught riding the bike on the road, I'm taking it away. Yeah. Well, I did. He did. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the end of that. So uh, that, that, that ended my motorcycling for quite a while, until back, uh, basically until 1986. Now, you started Strictly Hodaka in 86, and what was yes. it like, a hobby? Did you just do this because you were looking for parts for yourself? How did that culminate? Um, kind of a combination of both, Joe. It was uh, in 86, 
um, I was needing parts for uh, for my Wombat, and there were at the time there was three dealers you could find. They were in Cycle News, I think it was that you could find them. There was one in Missouri, there was one in Illinois, and then there was one in Johnsburg, New York, near Lake George. And uh, I was getting parts, but but even at that point, some of the parts that I was looking for were really hard to find. And uh, where I lived in Rhode Island, Ray Z's motorcycle shop was down the street, and Gordon Ray Z was a was actually a Hodaka dealer at one time. And um, so I went in there, and, and he had actually sold all of his parts to uh, Cliff Cycle in, um, in Norfolk, Massachusetts. So I called Cliff Cycle, and they said, well, we're not going to sell you just one part. You know, if you want this or whatever I needed, I forget. But you've got to buy the whole inventory. <laughs> Gosh, you know, how much, how much do you want? Right. And, and it, was, it was really pennies on the dollar, to be honest with you, because this is 86. Hodaka had gone out of business in 79. Um, so guys were just really, they never saw kind of a resurgence coming. I don't think anybody did. And uh, there, a lot of the dealers that I inevitably hooked up with were just were pretty much happy, you know, to get money for their stuff and, and to get it out, you yeah. know, turn it into cash because it had just been sitting there for 10 or 11 years. A lot of dealers that I had I'd met um, had thrown their parts out. They just didn't think there was ever going to be a, a need for them again, and they just tossed them to make, to make room. When, when you started Strictly Hodaka, I remember, let me put it this way, it was like 2000, 2001, I wanted a Super At, I found one that needed to be restored. You're obviously, or pretty much the only game in, that, in town at that point, but no matter what I needed, it seemed that you had. How many different parts for Hodakas did you personally reproduce? Well, uh, well over a thousand, I would say, you know, really hard to find parts, and, and, and I never took strictly Hodakas seriously as a business. I mean, it was a business in a sense, but at that time when I first started, um, Patty and I, we, we, had our, uh, we had our restaurant deli catering business seven days a week, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, we had, at the time, we had our USDA meat plant in, in northern Rhode Island where we were manufacturing salamis and such. So we were, we were really stretched thin. What I did is I ran a few ads in the old bike journal. Um, Greg Bastic, who was a dear friend, yes. Greg was the one that actually came up with the name Strictly Hodaka. He says, well, what are you selling? I said, I'm, I'm just selling, you know, because guys were calling me, well, do you have parts for Boltaco? Do you have parts for Anosa, you know? Um, no, I I'm only have parts strictly for Hodakas. And, and Greg was the one that actually came up with that, that name, Strictly Hodaka, which um, I thank him for. Yeah. But uh, we, uh, uh, but I'm sorry, I lost, I lost my train of thought. I beg your pardon, Joe. No, sorry, don't get old. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hey, no, you're... You know, you're, you're doing great, Paul, and we were talking about how many different parts you okay. uh, reproduced for, uh, for the Hodakas. Yeah, well, realistically, probably thousands. And, and again, when we we're talking about it being a business, I, I didn't look at it as a business. The monies that were being generated from sales of parts were getting rolled back into uh, reproducing parts or buying more inventories. And I was finding as I was buying more and more inventories, I, I probably purchased almost uh, 150, maybe 200 inventories, some very large, wow. some very small over the years while I was doing this. And, uh, and it was great to meet the old dealers and, and talk to them about the, the war stories of, uh, of back in the day. But uh, what, we, what we were doing was generating monies. And, and I saw the writing on the wall when I was buying these inventories. We still were not finding, uh, you know, certain hard to find parts. And, you know, maybe we'd come across one or two in an inventory, but there was a need. I could see the need to start focusing the monies on specific items that Hodaka was going to need, be it kick shafts or kick starters or uh, pistons or, or, uh, or rod kits. You know, one of, one of your uh, one of your sponsors, Vinco, Kurt Leverton. Yes. Um, he reached out to me. I think it was in 1989. Now he had just graduated college. Uh, he was dating his current wife, uh, Evelina. You know, his wife. Okay. And uh, and he reached out to me. He was. They had set up a little room in his mom and dad's uh, a spare room in his mom and dad's house in Des Moines or Urbandale. And he contacted me. He was going to reproduce Hodaka ring sets. And he said, you know, do you want to buy any? Would you? And I, sure, absolutely. And um, and that's what uh, what my my friendship with Kurt started right there. And we're we're still great friends to this day. Look where he's gone from having a, a selling a parts out of a kind of a spare bedroom in his mom and dad's house yeah. to you know owning hot rods, hot cams, and pivot works. But um, but but he, through, through Kurt and especially especially his wife Evelina, 
I was to give to them, you know, a, a hard to find part. They would draw the part for me. Uh, they would analyze the Rockwell number, uh, the hardness that needed to be. Uh, they would do all the work, and then they would, uh, you know, quote me. And uh, and uh, you know, sometimes I could say yes, and sometimes I could say no. But they made it uh, very, very, very easy for me to to reproduce parts. Just needed to have the money, and and we were all the sales again from Strictly Hodak. At that point, we were more or less focusing on. Uh, directly on, on manufacturing specific parts that I knew that we needed. Um, not all of them were money makers. I mean, there were things that we made that we didn't sell a lot of, but it it helped to keep Hodakas alive right. uh, with a product that they or a part that they had to have. Was was there one part, Paul? I think it was tank badges that I asked you about one time. There was one part in specific, specifically rather that you had to invest a lot of money in just to get it right before you even produced it. W what was that part? Was it a, was it tank badges? Um, it was actually it was a kickstart. The Hodaka 250s had a, had an issue. The, the Hodaka 250s, um, the kick shaft and the kicker itself, uh, they didn't really mate well. The, the, the shaft was too short. The, there was too much stress on the Kickstarter. So what we had to invest, and uh, and I believe it was Evelina from uh, from Hot Rods at the time that helped me with this, was we we created uh, we had a, a longer kick shaft made, and then we had the the knuckle on the kicker arm. Uh, where they made it uh, to be splined longer, and then instead of using a six millimeter uh, pinch bolt, we used an eight millimeter pinch bolt, and that was very expensive to do. It was, you know, two parts in the sense it had to be sold as a set. They had a customer had to pull the uh, engine apart, replace the uh, the kick shaft, and then utilize our uh, our, our new uh, our new Kickstarter with that. So yeah, that was that was pretty expensive, and but it was uh, it worked out, and, and it's kept a lot of bikes going. Yeah. Hey, hey, Paul, you had a great little museum up there. I remember seeing pictures of it with a lot of bikes on a, on a second floor. Do, do you still own all those bikes? Yeah, when I sold, I sold my, uh, the, the Strictly Hodaka business in, yeah. uh, in 2000, uh, I think it was June of 2016. I sold it to, uh, I beg your pardon, 2018. Yeah. I sold it to Terry Larson from Hodaka Parts. Terry's a great friend. I've known Terry for years, and I was out at the AIM Expo, uh, and, and Terry had, uh, uh, had, approached me down there to say, hey, he was buying uh, Hodaka parts and just wanted to let me know, heads up. And I said at that point, you know, why don't you buy me out too? Just kind of half joking. And and we talked and, and I ended up selling him the business. But when I did sell Terry the business with the licensing and the toolings and the parts and the trademarks and all of that, I, uh, I asked to keep all of my memorabilia um, and then all of the, uh, the the bikes that I've got, either my personal race bikes or or the museum bikes, and they're here right now, Joe, up in uh, in San Gabriel, Vermont, in my, in, my uh, in in our kind of museum that we've got here. Well, that's that's great that you still have them. You know, Paul, one of the most memorable events uh, every year when the Hodaka brand really became uh, reintroduced to everyone was Hodaka Days up in Oregon, and I remember Tommy Croft, Jim Pomeroy, Brad Lackey, of course. Harry Taylor. There were so many people that would flock up there every year for that reunion. What were what were some of the most memorable times for you in those days? Well, we had you know, Paul Clipper came all the way out from the East Coast. Uh, Super Hunky came out. Tom Penton, Tommy Rapp, uh, Ron Pomeroy, Jim mm -hmm. Pomeroy. Um, yeah, the, the most memorable times was the beginning. Um, what had happened? I became friends with Harry Taylor uh, over the phone, and uh, he needed a part. And, and I believe it was nineteen. Oh, I believe it was 1996. Um, Harry and Patty Taylor's son Brett uh, passed away of complications from diabetes, mm. and Brett had the uh, had the prototype Dirt Squirt 80, a very rare bike, uh, but he had the prototype, and it wasn't complete. And so Harry, uh, I, I I I knew how to reach Harry, but I, I did, he was kind of a god to me in a sense, and I didn't want to bug him. But he reached out to me looking for cylinder and and uh, cases and some other stuff for that for that bike to finish it out. And uh, he was a very, very proud man, Harry was, and uh, he never took anything from anybody. He always paid his way. And uh, when I talked to him on the phone, I just felt like I knew him all my life. And I said, hey, listen, I, I just bought this uh, Dirt Squirt 80 engine. Uh, it's reasonably clean. I, I only paid like $50 for it. It came out of Wisconsin. I've got it here. You know, let me, this is for your son's memory, the, the bike. Uh, you know, I'd like to give this to you. And, and he accepted that, which was really weird and we talked about it later that he d doesn't know why he accepted it but from there we became great friends and um 
And again, I lost my train of thought with this. I'm sorry. We, were, we, were, we were talking about the uh, early days of the Hodaka yeah. days and uh, all the, you know, motocross and motorcycle legends coming up there. And you said that the early days were the most memorable. They, they were. And, that, and the, the story with, goes to Harry is that we uh, got a chance to meet. Uh, he invited me out to the West Coast and uh, we were going to go to a Corvallis, an event that they had uh, a show and swap meet that they had down in Corvallis, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I accepted his uh, his, his invitation uh, to meet him finally face to face. And uh, uh, I came out with uh, George Cohn was a Hodaka dealer from Oklahoma. Jeff Hackett was a dear friend. Uh, he was a photographer for Old Bike Journal and and some others. Um, and then Roger Lippiet was a dealer in uh, in Ohio. All dear friends. So we all the four of us flew out. Uh, we met Harry and unbeknownst to us in in Athena, Oregon. Harry had, uh, for the first time in, in many, many years, had assembled all of the old Pabatco, the Hodaka people that live locally there. And we had a barbecue and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a great time. Then we drove off the next day. We all drove off to Corvallis, which is a you know uh, eight-hour drive. Yeah. And we had another great time there. When the weekend was done, when it was over, I said to Harry, I says, God, it would be great if we could do this every year. And uh, I said, what do you think? We do it in Athena. And... Uh, and that, that was the start of Hodaka Day. So the, really the unofficial start was in 1999, and the, the official start was 2000. But it was fun. It was simple. It was fun. And we kind of were winging it, you yeah. know, and, uh, uh, you know, parades down Main Street with Hodakas. And maybe in the first, first year there might have been 40 Hodakas, and, and now there are hundreds that show up. But uh, it was, it was family-oriented. It was fun. It was simple. It was kind of uh, fly by the cuff. And, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I look back at that and just... And I remember telling Harry back then, because a lot of uh, people would approach him and say, oh, you remember that race at Warshugel, or do you remember the race down at Hangtown? Yeah. And, you know, they, they were reminiscing. And I looked at Harry one day while well, this is getting going on, maybe 2002, and I said, you know what, Harry? Right now, right here, these are the good old days. That's what right. we're doing right now. And I uh, look back at it, Joe, and yeah. God, it's so true. It, so it, true. It really, it really is. You never know when you're, you know, you're making an unforgettable memory like that. And, well... Needless to say, a guy like Harry Taylor and the Pabatco people all being together there, uh, Hodaka heaven, I guess you could call it, you know? It, it was, Joe. It was kind of like sacred ground and all of that. And, and, uh, and I just, it was real people and it was, uh, it, it was just fun. It was yeah. fun. Hey, Paul, we mentioned a little bit earlier when I commented on an article saying that they said that you saved the name. It was in an article from Inside Vintage. And, uh, they said that, and it also said something about um, someone had bought a remaining parts inventory from the factory, but the inventory had burned down. Uh, it was lost in a fire. So uh, were they right about losing a huge inventory like that, and are they also wrong, or are they right about you being able to save the Hodaka name when you resurrected it in 1987? Well, I, I never resurrected the Hodaka name. It was, it was, it's a cult following, Joe. I mean, I might have been back in the day, the loudmouth or the voice. <laughs> you know, it was my love and my passion. I mean, you and I were, were chasing each other at races at, at uh, Thunder Ridge and oh, yeah. so on here in the Northeast. We had so much fun. We did. But no, I, it, was, it, it was a total, the Hodaka thing, the resurrection, is, it was a total team effort. And the best part about it was a lot of it had to do with the original Pabatco people, too. They loved what we were doing. They were a part of it also. Ed Chestnut, Jim Gentry, Marvin Foster, Harry Taylor. Um, it, was, it was so much fun. But, but no, it wasn't. Uh, I did not resurrect the brand at all. Um, and as far as that article goes, yeah, there was, um, and I'll leave it to you to be the judge of what I'm going to say on this, but there was, when, when Hodaka had gone out of business in 1979, mm -hmm. uh, there, was, uh, there were nine distributors in the United States. Uh, two really large ones that were still going. Uh, one was uh, Bill Sodaka in Mexico, Missouri, and the other big one was uh, Wheels of Time in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, right near State College. Uh, Bill Sodaka uh, and Pabatco had offered, uh, you know, to take back all of the remaining parts from the distributors, uh, and uh, most distributors did send their parts back. Bill Sodaka chose not to. He chose to continue to service his dealer network in and around Missouri, and uh, which was very admirable on his end. Um, now, the remaining inventory from distributors were sent back to Babatco, and I believe if memory serves me correctly, there were seven uh, train cars worth of parts that were sent to Wheels of Time in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. 
along with those, the inventory of parts, there were, um, I believe, eight motorcycles, six or eight motorcycles that were part of the Pavetco display in their main offices. They all had uh, historical significance. Uh, the 10,000th Podaka was there. The number one Wombat was there. Uh, the 35,000th Ace 100, or eight, it, 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 anyway, they were all there, part of this museum display at Pabaco in Athena, and they were also in Harry Taylor's Road Racer. They were all shipped back to uh, Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, where they were displayed. And shortly, uh, it, it, Wheels of Time kept going. They had a, a, a mysterious uh, fire. They had, uh, their, their warehouse was part of an old bowling alley, all wood. And uh, they had a, a kind of a, what was called a mysterious fire in 1981. Well, several weeks before the fire, um, and I know for a fact that uh, there were dealers a fairly close proximity within 100, 200 miles of Wheels of Time that were approached on buying huge amounts of Hodaka parts at one time at bargain basement prices. I mean, really, really cheap stuff being dumped. Okay. And uh, one of those people was a gentleman named Jake Fisher, Fisher's Competition in Butler, Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, Jake took advantage of a, a lot of that inventory, which in turn, yes, I did buy from Jake uh, 20 years ago maybe, but huge, huge, huge amounts of stuff that a dealer wouldn't want. But Jake was approached uh, by the owners of Wheel at the time. He bought the uh, this tractor trailer truck load or maybe more worth the parts and shortly thereafter there was a mysterious fire now the I'm not going to mention his name but the gentleman that owned wheels of time I've spoken to several times on the phone mm -hmm. he claims that there was a, a fire and that everything was destroyed and I questioned him specifically about those motorcycles that were part of that museum display yes he said those were all burned in the fire too and then I went upstairs to my museum display and I took photos of three or four of them that I own, that are here. They're brand new still. They've never been started. And I said, how can you explain this? If they burn in the fire, they're right here. Here's the serial numbers. The, the, and he never was able to answer that. So, um, Did Fisher pay him? Did Fisher pay him before the fire? Yes. Fisher, Fisher, Jake Fisher paid him uh, pennies on the dollar. I mean, he was, he was paying you know, dealer or distributor pricing as it was. Right. But, but Jake paid him uh, uh, pennies on the dollar for the, on the value of what those parts were. Was the Harry... In turn, I bought from Jake, and, and now that Terry Larson at Hodaka Parts now has. Was the Harry Taylor Daytona bike in that fire? No, and you... Uh, uh, I've, been, I've been asked about what bikes would I like, you know? And, yeah. and that is one bike that is... I would give anything, almost anything, obviously, for that bike. That bike was part of that museum display. I had tried chasing that bike down finding it and knowing that, that I knew where all of the other bikes, part of that museum display that supposedly burned, I knew where every single one of them were. Some were here, some were on the West Coast. But no one seemed to know where the Harry Taylor bike went. And I always wanted to buy that bike, and I was always going to give it back to Harry if I had found it. So, um, so you, don't, you don't think that it did burn, and it's out there somewhere? I do. Uh, Jack Broomall, a dear friend of mine from, uh, from down in Pennsylvania, he did a Harry Taylor replica. Phenomenal. I mean, to the T. Uh, photos that I had, uh, photos that uh, Harry's family had, uh, his, his daughter Holly had had, uh, other photos from some of the people that worked at Pavadco and helped Harry with the, the build on that bike. So Jack Brumall built a replica. I mean, nuts off to it. It's, it's dead on. Um, but yes, Harry Taylor's bike, I would believe, is still out there. And I would love nothing more to find that bike. And, and if I could buy it, I'd, I'd give it to his, uh, his daughter Holly. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Hodaka actually did make two works bikes, the Harry Taylor bike, and I think they made a factory bike for Tommy Croft, correct? Uh, not really. Uh, they, uh, yeah, they, made a, they made a variety of different bikes. Now, as far as there were two real uh, Pabatco Hodaka-sponsored factory racers for, mm -hmm. for Hodaka, two of them. One was Harry Taylor. Uh, he was in charge of the R&D, and he was the race team. Mm -hmm. And the other was Tommy Croft. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was it. I mean, the other guys, there were a lot of other guys uh, out there that were sponsored by dealers, sponsored by distributors, some great people, great names. Um, and some of the guys that started on Hodakas and, and later changed uh, to different brands uh, um, and, and go on with their pro pro uh, uh, lives. Yeah. But, uh, but Tommy Croft and Harry Taylor were really the only 
factory Hodaka racers. Tommy was, I, I believe, if uh, my memory again is correct, Tommy was staying at Harry's house uh, in Oregon, and Tommy's from San Diego area, and mm -hmm. Tommy was staying at Harry's house in Oregon, and got a call, uh, from what I understand, from Marty Smith, said, hey, there's an opening at Team Honda, you know, do you want to, do you want to, join Team Honda, you have to leave Hodaka. And uh, I believe Tommy was a little torn, I mean, uh, uh, loyalty, yeah. but, uh, but, but and, and from what Harry told me, Harry says, come on, kid, you'd be crazy not to join Team Honda. And, uh, and Tommy left and, uh, and, and, and went with Honda. And the rest, told, as, they, as they say, told, is history. True class guy, Tommy and Cindy Croft, too. Oh, oh ab absolutely. You know, throughout, throughout a little conversation here, a few names came up. Uh, one of them was Greg Bastic, and then there was another topic where you talked about you and I racing back in the Northeast uh, or in the early 2000s, which kind of leads me to my next question or a little bit of a statement, then you could tell me a little bit more about it. I think it was, okay. around, I think it was around 2002. I was on a Can-Am, you know, racing at Armour, racing at the ACR events. The Can-Am was an incredible bike, and it was yeah. like just, just like a whole shot bike for me. I never, I never was concerned. And one day, I don't know if it was Mid-Ohio or where it was, Greg Bastic, who I didn't know real well at the time, lines up next to me on a Hodaka 125, and I'm like, yeah, okay. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Greg Bastic handed me my ass on that 125. I chased him for five laps on that Can-Am, and no matter what. And I didn't expect to pass him in a turn, but I thought, if I get him on a straightaway, there's yeah. no way he could... Well, all I did was see the back of that Wolverine, I think you own it, and I want to know more about what was done to it. Sure. Well, the Wolverine, that, that year was uh, actually 2000, Joe. 2000. And um, it was mid-Ohio, I remember, and I was, I was there with you. Yeah. Um, a great day, a real great day. And how the Wolverine came to be is uh, a year or two before, I, Greg and I were riding back together from, uh, from mid-Ohio. And I was driving, and Greg says, you know, do you think uh, Hodaka could beat a, a, ever beat a Nelsonor? I said, yeah, I, I I believe so, you know, and, and Greg at that time had been national 125 CC expert champ yeah. and he was r racing Elsinore's. Um, and I said, yeah, um, you know, when we get back, I'll, I'll reach out to Harry and, and see what he thinks if he can help. And Harry said, oh, hell yeah, we can, we can do that. You know, I can do this, I can do that. And, and <clears throat> as far as the Wolverine goes, it was my first, uh, you know, getting involved in a, in a real, in a sense, kind of a works bike. And I was really, really green and, and didn't know a hell of a lot. Still don't, but, um, <laughs> but uh, Harry built the engine. The cases were heavily ported. The cylinder was heavily ported. Uh, we weren't, you know, at that time, we, didn't, we weren't using D-Force reeds. I think it was just still Hodaka reeds that we were using. Uh, we had works performance shocks on the rear, uh, a Swenko lengthened chromoly swing arm on the bike, um, and, um, and, uh, and Harry Taylor built the pipe, actually, which is hanging upstairs in the museum here, too. A hand-built pipe, hand-rolled cones, and all of that. And, uh, and Greg did pretty good on it that day, yeah. He sure, he sure did. But, but Gre Greg could ride the bulls, uh, balls off a bull. He too, could. So. He, he could. Let's fill in the gap for me a little bit. Well, maybe, maybe I should just back up here a second, or... Let, let's, let's talk about this. What happened between... The, the, the selling of Strictly Hodaka and, and the Preston Petty thing. Now, I don't want to get too into the Preston Petty thing right away, but was there a gap in between the selling of Strictly Hodaka and were, were you back in the, in the sausage business again? What happened there? Uh, it took a little downtime. Okay. Uh, and, and be, we're talking friend to friend here, although other people are listening in, which is fine. <laughs> and it's pretty common knowledge, I think, now. Uh, my wife, Patty, uh, yeah. we've been together now for 44 years. Uh, she was a junior in high school when we started dating. Yes. And um, a few years ago, uh, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And um, it, uh, it, it took the wind out of our sails, and we knew that she had had it. And the good, the good part about that was, uh, it was a good part, was that she did not have any symptoms. They had found the brain tumor, in a sense, accidentally. She was having some sight issues. Uh, had an MRI done, mm -hmm. uh, it was picked up at that point, and we were monitoring it and watching it, and um, if it grew, um, then we needed to have it removed. Yeah. When I say we, I mean we're, she and I are a team. And um, uh, so, inevitably, it was almost a year ago today, it was a year ago uh, this past Thursday that she had the surgery, and uh, to have the brain tumor removed in Boston at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, 
surgery went phenomenal. I mean, she had a brain tumor. They removed it. She was in the ICU. After returning to the ICU, uh, after the surgery, 23 hours later, she is physically walking, walking. They didn't wheel her out. She walked out of the Anna-Farber Cancer Institute. So physically, the surgery went absolutely phenomenal. It went great. But with that is, you know, there was a lot of emotional stuff that we needed to work on and, and, uh, and adjust to. And I, my focus really needed to be, and I, I apologized to Preston a couple of days ago on the phone about this, is but my focus had to be on my wife and my family. And, and uh, it was just hard to get my mojo going. So there was a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a kind of a slack in my life, whereas I wasn't, you know, totally focused uh, and pushing so hard on the on the Preston Petty thing. No, you got to take uh, care of your family first, Paul. That's always that's so always first. I, I get it. You get it. Yeah. A lot. Most people do get it. Not everybody, but 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 we do. And um, so uh, so anyway, the long and the short is, I I took a little bit of downtime and. And a couple of weeks ago, you and I talked by phone. I was riding my uh, my Harley uh, Sportster with the Preston Petty outfit on it, and yeah. up in Stowe, Vermont, and felt free as a bird, and uh, kind of getting back on track again. It's been a year since her surgery, and everything is great, and life is good, and grandkids are good, family's good, and so now I figure I feel that. And, and helping with the sausage company, yes, absolutely. It's uh, it's been a joy to get back involved in it. I'm not physically manufacturing the sausages or salamis or any of that anymore, but I'm um, doing the quality control with it and, and uh, do all the spices for the company and and uh, and try to handle the back end where Patty still manages the front end of the business. So when did you guys get really into the into the food business? When That was before uh, the motorcycles, totally. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we, we, uh, we started in uh, Connecticut, I'm sorry, started in Connecticut and then... Uh, and then Patty and I moved in 1982 to uh, to Rhode Island to to raise our son. Uh, later on, we, we our daughter was born in 1988. Um, but uh, we we wanted to slow our lives down, and and uh, it, at that point, Connecticut was getting pretty crazy and pretty you know it was rush rush rush, and we just wanted to slow it down. So we uh, we we started a, a catering deli food business again, breakfast, lunch, dinner, seven days a week, and it it took its toll. Um, on, on, on our work and our time, on our free time and all. And to get back into the motorcycles uh, in 1986 was just a, it was something for me to take kind of a break. I could go downstairs in the basement and tinker on the engines or tinker on the bikes and, and kind of, you know, get away from the business aspect for a few hours at least. Sure. Well, after that, Paul, I know you, you, you sold the Strictly Hodaka brand and you went through that, uh, that battle that, thank the Lord, everything worked out and you guys are doing good. But then you took on a whole new project, and I really want to know about this from, from start to finish, which is, of course, the resurrection of the Preston Petty brand. I know it. you began making fenders in 2016, but there had to be a lot of groundwork before that. And I guess the first question I want to ask is, do you own that brand? How, how did that come about? Well, and that's a, that's a great question. There's been, I, you know, you say that uh, you see things on Facebook. Well, if it's on Facebook, it must be real, yeah. and uh, not necessarily. But I've read a lot of things on how we've come about this 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 uh, the business. And um, in 19, 1999, uh, I got the opportunity to meet Preston Petty for the first time. He was being inducted into the AMA Hall of Fame with Jim Pomeroy at the, the same time. Yeah. I was at Mid Ohio. I was with Greg Bastic and Harry Taylor and Bill Bastic and uh, and a bunch of other great guys. And uh, through the pits comes Jim Pomeroy, who was very very dear friend of Harry's. Uh, Harry and and Jim's dad uh, Don Pomeroy were absolute best friends growing up. They both grew up in Yakima, Washington. Mm -hmm. So Jimmy came over, and with him was Preston Petty. And I got a chance to say hello to Preston. I was in awe of Preston, and and uh, and Jim Jim was just a at that point he was a, a friend already. I'd met Jim. But uh, I got a chance to meet Preston, and uh, this was 1999. And I was doing the Hodaka thing. We were doing some um, uh, plastics that were being cast. Um, you would pour a plastic material like an epoxy into a, a silicone tool or, a, or a, an epoxy tool, and it would make a part. And um, so we were dabbling in plastics, not injection molding or vacuum forming, but just kind of dabbling in a little bit. We were reproducing some rubber parts that way also. And... Um, uh, I got the idea that, uh, you know, maybe we could get more involved with the plastics. And uh, I did a, a search on the Internet, uh, and the Preston Petty trademark had been abandoned. 
Um, hmm. So uh, I, I didn't know how to reach Preston. So what I did is I called Jimmy, Jim Pomeroy, yeah. and uh, I said, Jimmy, and, uh, and, and there are two people that, that knew before I called Preston what I was going to do. One was Jim Pomeroy, and one was Harry. And I told them both that I was going to, to talk to Preston and to see if uh, he had any objection to my applying for the abandoned Preston Petty Products trademark. And, uh, and I told them what I was planning to do and, uh, you know, to try to build back the brand. And th this was in 2003. So Jimmy gave me Preston's phone number. Um, I called Preston and Preston said, well, Paul, you know that I don't own the trademark any longer. And I said, I understand that, Preston. And uh, if memory serves me correctly, he says, well, you don't need, you know, you don't really need to ask me. And I says, well, yeah, I do. It's, it's your name. It's Preston Petty Products. Yes. And uh, it's got your name on it. And I just want to get your blessing. If you don't want me to do this, then I won't. And uh, at the same time, uh, unfortunately, there was a gentleman in, uh, in Ohio that was uh, doing the, uh, he had applied for a trademark for the Penton name. And uh, he never reached out to Mr. Penton. He never asked. He just did it. And um, uh, anyway, long and short is that with Preston, I asked his blessing. He responded, is there anything that I can do to help? And I said, y yeah, I, if, if you're willing, yeah. if you could just write a letter saying that, you know, you're a living individual and that, you know, you have no objection to this, um, you send me a letter, I'll send it in with my trademark application. And uh, he did. We did, and it was uh, pretty much a slam dunk. Now, Paul, uh, that's, in two, that's in 2003. You didn't make a fender till 2016. Actually, I, I thought about it, Joe, and it was actually 2010. We were dabbling in some injection molding in Italy. Still a long, uh, we still a long time. We were in the IT rear in, in 2010, so I, I apologize. No, uh, that, no, no, it's still a long time, though, Paul, that you had to lay all that groundwork before you made a fender. Well, Joe, what the problem was, and, and the reason why I sold, part of the reason why I sold Strictly Hodaka was because I couldn't do both, and I couldn't do them right. Um, I could try to do Strictly Hodaka and try to do Preston Petty at the same time, but one needed my, uh, one of them needed my full and undivided attention. Sure. And um, so once Strictly Hodaka was sold to Terry, uh, Terry Larson from Hodaka Parts, then that freed up the time and the energy and and all that I needed to start devoting more time and energy to the Preston Petty line. Now, and it, and, it, and it did take a while to get that going. Tell me about the molds, Paul. I mean, w w did you have original? You, you didn't see the original molds, did you? The ones that Preston. No, we never, never have, Joe. I, I, what happened was, I believe it was in '79 or '80 that when Preston sold the business to Scott, um, they ran it for about a year, and then they filed for bankruptcy, and, and um, everything was gone. Um, I. There might be listeners of yours out there that might know where some of the tools are. I do not. We've never seen any of the original tools. Mm -hmm. Although I was at Jay Leno's garage a year ago with uh, with the Penton family and Carl Crank, and Carl actually worked for Preston. And Carl mentioned to me while we were together, he said that he had one of the taillight lens tools. So, uh, so at least that's one of the original tools that I know that was still out there. Yeah. But what we had to do is we had to take brand new original parts in good condition and we had to uh, do reverse engineering on that uh, to build tools. So the Fender tools, they run about $25,000 give or take. Um, our front, front uh, the MX front Fender tool was, uh, was more of a problem. Uh, we, we manufactured that. Uh, we used a company in, in California that I won't name. Yeah. And um, they, uh, I, I had a, a, a friend that had been in the injection molding business. He drew the prints. He had the fender, drew the prints, the plans for the, for the reverse engineering. And it turned out that wasn't right. Um, so that wasn't on the, on the company. That was my fault. Uh, we realized that. We manufactured. Uh, they realized that what was being shown um, uh, in the tool that we had produced based on this drawing was not giving us the same effect or the same look as the fender that we had supplied them with, a new old stock one. So we immediately had to uh, spend more money and modify that, that original MX fender tool, which we, we did, my mistake, and uh, the company manufactured a, a one-off uh, prototype fender for me to, to look at. Um, at that time, a dear friend of mine, Mike Murphy from Rocon Renew, was uh, invested in the company. Um, he's one of my best friends in the world. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he helps me 
we talk daily. He's a, a dear friend of Preston's. But Murph was the one that uh, that really I, I relied on as far as somebody to, to, to talk to about this. We, we had uh, this one prototype fender made for us. It was $3,000 for one fender. I received it. It's, it's hanging right above my head here right now. <laughs> and uh, it was perfect. It was uh, 29 uh, inches uh, tip to tip. Uh, the flare in the front with it, where, where, where the MX was uh, is, is uh, six inches. Everything was perfect. Yes, yes, yes. We were good. Let's go. So we made the, we, we did the production run of fenders, and uh, they not all of them came out like they should have um, in the beginning. So it's it, that part of it has been a learning curve. We've since spent uh, another fifteen thousand dollars with with uh, Polysport in Portugal to again fix that tool and uh, we're now starting to receive uh, those fenders with a new tighter radius and, and uh, they're, they're 100%. So th were those the only real quality controls issues you've had so far? Yeah, uh, yes and no. I mean, that was the major quality control issue. Obviously, the MX front fender was, was very, very, very important to Preston Petty products. Yeah. But the other thing is I had vendors, I had vendors in, uh, in, in Italy, um, a big name brand company that we all know. Uh, I won't say, okay. but they were, they were manufacturing some of my products. Uh, I had uh, two companies, one in Gardena, California, and another company in Long Beach, California, manufacturing products. Everybody was using the exact same color material. Uh, it was one color material bought from the one source, uh, supplied to all three vendors, and um, the color matches were coming out exactly right. Um, you know, if one company was making MX front fenders in, let's say, a Bull Taco Blue, and uh, we needed Bull Taco Blue uh, headlights, uh, they might have been a slightly different color than, than what was being produced. So what it was a big move that I had to do, and a lot of guys were upset with, and the companies were upset with me, but we had to pull all the tools from all the different companies, and um, I was approached by Polysport, and, uh, and their number one concern is quality, 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 quality. Sure. And, uh, and that has been true. Polysport reached out to me. They helped me um, with uh, logistics, moving the tools from the U.S., from Italy uh, to Portugal. Um, I flew to Portugal, spent a long time there in, in beautiful Porto, and, and, uh, and worked with them on, on the tools, saw the tools coming out of the crates from the U.S. and from Italy. Um, some of the tools weren't complete, so Polysport had to go back in again and take these tools that supposedly have been being used uh, and, uh, and, and fix them. Uh, some were already scratched in the surfaces. And so Polysport went in, they polished, they fixed, they, they, they modified everything to make it exactly right. And um, so that's, you know, it, it would be easy to, uh, I would love to be able to make our products necessarily in the United States so I, we didn't have to pay the shipping from, from Europe to, uh, to the U.S. But, sure. uh, but, but the most important thing, and the thing that Preston strives the most, is quality, quality, quality. He's, he's still, we, he's still pretty, he, he really oversaw a lot of this stuff happening, didn't he, Paul? Well, back in the day, Joe, heck, and when he was in Newburgh, he was the guy running the, running the, running the machines. He was the guy fixing the tools. He, he was the guy out doing the, uh, the sales calls. Yeah. Preston did it all. I don't know when he found time to sleep. <laughs> you know, for a while, I think he backed off racing for a few years, you know, because of the, the business aspect, but... I mean, my hat's off to that gentleman. He he just worked his butt off and and um, and it worked so hard and his love and his passion. But yeah, I mean, he he was Peston was the guy making the tools. So you know, I'm not I'm not that talented. I'm not that smart. So we have to rely on on other companies and other people to do what needs to be done. Are are you are you reproducing everything that Preston Petty made originally in in the heyday of the '70s? Every item. No, there's there's a lot of items like before uh, before you called me, Joe. There's there's uh, I just received a phone call from a gentleman in the, or an email, excuse me, from a gentleman um, who was looking for like the mini mutters. You know, those those would be ideal for like an 18 inch front wheel on a bike. Yes. Uh, and uh, no, we haven't reproduced those because of the our investment right now. I mean, we we were we had owed Polysport at one time over 100 grand, and we're knocking that down little by little. But, um, you know, we need to pay down a debt. And then we're not taking a salary. We're not taking a dime from the company. We're just, everything that we are generating goes back into, first of all, paying down Polysport, paying them back for their generosity. Mm -hmm. They've allowed me four years uh, with no interest, which, which is huge. I mean, they believe in the company. They believe in Preston Petty. 
um, and they believe in me. Yeah. And uh, you know, once once we get this pulled down a little bit, the debt pulled down, then yeah, we've we've got some items like the regular the rounder mutter fenders uh, that that didn't have the IB the flat spot on the top, mm -hmm. and the, and the rear mutters the the long longer ones that are like five and a half inches wide, six inches wide, <clears throat> like a full fender that's rounded. Those there, there's a bunch of things. We've got a bunch of new things that are coming. Um, I don't want to announce it today because I'd like, but I'd like to use your uh, your vintage uh, Q and A uh, show to to make those announcements. Absolutely. When we're ready. Oh yeah, I, I would be uh, more than happy to do that. One other thing I noticed that you don't make, or you make the fender, but it's not called a Tony D fender. Yes. Why is that? Well, the reason the reason we did, we were calling it the Tony D in the beginning. Yeah. And. Um, I was approached uh, for a good reason by Tony himself. Yeah. He reached out to me, and uh, he wanted uh, to be compensated for that. And um, you know, in all fairness, I, you know, I figured a, a, a price per fender, and uh, Tony didn't think that that was enough. And um, at the time, uh, a dear mutual friend of yours, Joe, and, and of mine, Tom White, yeah. uh, seemed to get kind of in the middle and. and to help me and to broach this with Tony and and uh, it just we couldn't come to an agreement about you know compensating Tony uh, to, uh, to to do the fenders and keep put his name on it. So uh, my promise to Tony is that I will never ever ever call him the Tony D. They are um, Preston. The, the name that Preston had given the fenders was the MX front. Yes. And that's what we're going to stick with, what Preston called it. Well, you know, Paul, if it were me, see, you don't think like an Italian. It surprises me. you got all this sausage <laughs> and all this food, right? You've got, yeah. Anna, you've got Anna Romano Di Stefano and Tony Di Stefano. You should yeah. have made some kind of barter with the sausage and the prosciutto and the mozzarella. You, you had all Joe, the cards, I, Paul. I sent it to him, Joe. I just, it just, I, maybe it wasn't enough. I don't know. Really? <laughs> that's a, all right. Well, then, you did play it, I guess, uh, as best as you could. What, what, what can we do now? So what, what, was, what, was really the, what was really the biggest hurdle, though, Paul, with getting the, the petty name and the product back out there again? Was, was there, other than what you've already told us about molds and Preston giving you his blessing and everything else, was there anything else out there that was uh, really difficult to, to get over? Um, well, when the ball really started to roll, Joe, when we first introduced the, uh, the MX Front Fender, um, it was coming out. We had a lot of really good uh, PR publicity all around the world for it. And then, unfortunately, there was a, a post on Facebook, Preston's health had fallen. Uh, he, had, uh, he had had an issue, and, oh, yeah. and uh, there, was, there was some stuff on Facebook that, you know, these new guys, meaning me, uh, were not giving back to Preston and not helping Preston. It sounded like we were taking advantage of Preston. And, uh, and that, that hurt because that it's was never the truth, and uh, that was never, ever, ever happened here and, and the negative PR um, it, it hurt it, it slowed stuff down I guess that was one of the, the hardest obstacles mm -hmm. uh, to overcome well other... as far as other stuff it's um, no it's 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 all it's hard it's just a matter of like anything you do too Joe it's just trying and, and working really hard at something and keeping your eye on the bullseye and, and making it work that's it keeping your nose to the grindstone and you know you can't hit a home run every day you try the best you can and you got to expect things uh you know some stumbling blocks and it makes you stronger when you get over them so you know er you're absolutely right Joe. yeah and, and earlier you mentioned that you were uh, you were a guest on jay leno's garage so so what's it like to sit across from jay leno i mean a guy who's obviously interviewed so many celebrities you're sitting across from jay what's that like Actually, it was really easy. Um, Jay, uh, back in 92, we, uh, my wife and I were written up in the L.A. Times as uh, unsolicited. The uh, food editor of the L.A. Times had come into our, our deli mm -hmm. in Rhode Island, and uh, we didn't know. She never identified herself, and she went back to L.A., and she wrote an article, uh, America's Best, Worth Waiting For, for Tuna Salamis. And from that, we, were, that we didn't know it was coming out. I think it was a Thursday, and... Uh, uh, all of a sudden, the phone started to ring at our deli, you know, because the article had our phone number there. There wasn't—I don't think the internet was really strong at that point, if it was even going. And um, uh, the mayor of uh, L.A., uh, his office called, wanting to order some more salamis. Uh, uh, Clint Eastwood's office—he was mayor of Carmel at the time. His his, his office called, and then uh, Mavis Leno, Jay's wife, called, and. Uh, uh, well, she said, "This is Mrs. Leno and, and our Mavis Leno," and, and she placed this order with us. And uh, uh, just 
to verify it was the Leno's, mm-hmm. I, I reached out again to Greg Bastic. He was at the old Bike Journal, yeah. and his uh, his boss, uh, dear friend Buzz Canner, had just interviewed Jay at his home. So I asked, you know, okay, we're sending this package to this address in Beverly Hills. Is this the Leno address? He said, Yeah, it is. So uh, I, being a uh, thinking I was funny, I put a strictly Hodaka business card in with the, the stuff and gave him some free salamis and stuff. And I wrote on the back of my card, I said, Hey, Jay, you need to get a real motorcycle. You need to get a Hodaka. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a few days later, and uh, uh, my wife. It was lunchtime, it was a Friday in our deli, it was packed, it was summertime, it was crazy. And my wife, Patty, answered the phone, um, thinking it was a phone in order. And, uh, and, and the guy says, hey, he said, uh, this is Jay Leno, I'd like to talk to Paul. <laughs> and my wife thought it was a prank. Sure. And she, Patty said, oh, yeah, right. And, well, he's a little busy right now. And, uh, and, and Jay said, well, uh, oh, okay, uh, this, is, this is Jay Leno, I'll call back. And she said, is this really Jay Leno? He said, yeah. So anyway, got on the phone with, uh, with Jay. He was super neat, super cool. Invited us to the Tonight Show and uh, to come sit in the audience with his, uh, with him and or his wife, uh, which we did. Nice. But uh, we had the motorcycle connection. So and, and I, uh, a bunch of years later, I had a brand new combat wombat motorcycle I had purchased in an inventory, brand new. And uh, I reached out to Jay because back in the day, Hodaka had John Wayne, they had Mannix, mm-hmm. um, they had Peter Graves from Mission Impossible doing promo, pr- promos on, on, their, on their bikes. And I reached out to Jay and I said, you know, John Wayne even did this. And all, I'm not looking to promote Strictly Hodaka, I'm just looking to, you know, promote Ho- the Hodaka brand by yeah. having you just sit on the bike, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, and he said, really, John Wayne, huh? I'd like to have a photo of that. And <laughs> since I'd given him one, uh, I met him at Foxwoods Casino, he was doing a show that night, and, uh, and, uh, you know, so we got a chance to meet there and, and talk, and my wife and I had met him several times. So anyway, long and the short of it, when I, when I sat down with Jay at, at, uh, to do the interview, I was only filling in for Ken Smith. Ken Smith wrote the Hodaka book, and Jay was interviewing uh, me on behalf of Ken Smith for the Hodaka book. And, uh, oh, okay. So talking, yeah, you, you did the foreword to that book, though. You wrote the foreword to that book. I, I, did, I did write the foreword to it, and it was basically just to thank Ken and and to thank all of the uh, the original tobacco people for all of their help to get the book done and support. Um, and the reason why we I pushed on the book, and, and the, the book came out in 2014, which was a Hodaka's 50th anniversary. And uh, I wanted to have the book done before uh, Harry Taylor had passed, but he had passed in 2013. And uh, he was the driving force behind me, the motivator that, that I wanted to, to show I was going to get this done. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it in time for the finish line, but... Um, but we got the book done nonetheless, and Ken and Ed Chestnut and uh, Ed, Ed Chestnut from Pebeco yeah. uh, and Chuck Swanson, they spent you know weeks here at our house in Vermont we going over all of the, the rare information and such that I've got here. And it, it, The book would not have happened if it was not for Ken Smith from VMX Magazine. He would, did a phenomenal job. Yeah, and as he's done throughout the years with VMX and with supporting uh, so many events and, and doing so many things, uh, Ken Smith, if you're listening, we are uh, we're all we all owe you, owe you a, a debt of gratitude, so to speak. Now, a little bit earlier, Paul, you did say something about a wish list of motorcycles, and if you could have one, well, the Harry Taylor bike was was one of them. Um, maybe are there two or three others that, if money were no object, you'd love to have in your collection? Well, Preston said this. I'm, I'm going to repeat what Preston said. I'm, I'm a simple man with simple means, and and. I've got pretty much everything that I need, Joe. Uh, my favorite bikes, I've, I've actually got, I've got a, an older uh, air-cooled KDX uh, 200 that for the woods in Vermont is just absolutely perfect. And I've got any Hodaka that I want, so that's not a problem. Yeah. The Harley Sportster that I built in the pre- with the Preston Petty dual sport look with the LED headlight, I absolutely love that bike. So to, to have another bike, it would be the Harry Taylor bike, mm-hmm. the Road Racer. And uh, I think the time's going to come pretty soon where I want to get maybe a KTM uh, adventure bike or something so I can do some adventure rides too. But besides that, I'm, I'm, I'm good, Joe. I'm yeah, good. I, I know the feeling. So um, what else, Paul? Is there anything else you want to talk about this morning or is there anyone you want to, uh, to mention on the show? Uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk about whatever you like right now. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, Going back to the Hodaka thing, it seems like sometimes, Joe, our lives are in chapters and yeah. such. And the Hodaka chapter is a, it's a great chapter. Um, 
and uh, I, I want to, I wouldn't have done the Hodaka thing that I did if it was not for the love and, and the trust and the, uh, and, and the care and, and, and the nurturing that the original Pabatco people had entrusted in me and given me. One is Mildred Miley, whose husband owned the company. She, uh, back in 1999, when we first went to, to uh, Athena, the old Pabatco building was still there. Um, downstairs was a company called Western Farm Services that sold uh, uh, commercial fertilizer for the farms. Uh -huh. um, we were allowed to get into the building. We went upstairs in the building, the second story, where uh, Marvin Fosters, uh, who was in charge of promotion and marketing, and uh, uh, Morris Lee, who was the chief engineer's office, were. And when we went upstairs, there were cobwebs. You had to cobwebs galore. You, you couldn't see. It was just full of cobwebs. And, and a buddy of mine, Jeff Hackett, had a video camera and was taping this. And here was all this old, original memorabilia. Posters still on the walls, uh, brand new dealer signs that no one had ever seen before that never were, were out there, uh, pictures, uh, blueprints. The original blueprints were still there. And, uh, and Mrs. Miley uh, entrusted me with those to do the right thing and to promote Hodaka. And as did Jim Gentry uh, from, from Pabatco, things that Jim has given me, and, and, and Chestnut and, and uh, Harry especially too, and Marvin, Chuck. Um, I just want to thank them for, for trusting in me to, to allow me to do what I did when I did it. Um, you know, I did it for uh, Strictly Hodaka we had around for 32 years. It was a good run, it was a great run. But I was tired of the parts business, Joe, and, and I needed to focus on the Preston Petty thing, which I'm feeling really, really good and positive about now. Yes. But I just want to, I want to thank the Pavatko people and, and the love that they've given to me, and I hope that I gave it back. And, um, and then I'd also like to thank Preston, because Preston is, a, uh, I know to everybody out there, he's, he's a legend. Of course he is, and, you know, he, but he is a true gentleman. And anybody that knows Preston like you do, Joe, and I do, certainly is. you know, and, and, and all of our friends, he is the real deal. He is so humble. He is so sincere. And the things that Preston has done in his life are just amazing. He, he, didn't, he didn't bring it up, but, you know, he had his, uh, his twin-engine plane, and he flew around the world by himself, you know. I mean, yeah. that was, I don't know what year it was, but, but it, uh, probably in the, in the late 70s, I guess. Yeah. But around the world by himself. Preston was on the Concorde, flew from, uh, from uh, London to New York, had breakfast in London, got on the Concorde, and, um, and then uh, uh, the, the, the captain actually invited him into the cockpit. Preston said he was in the cockpit of the Concorde for half an hour talking to the captain about, you know, the airplane. And wow. gosh, I mean, all this stuff that, well, in a little, another little story that Preston, I'm going to, uh, Preston, if you're listening, you're going to kick my butt, but <laughs> there was, uh, I was in, uh, uh, we were going to go do the, the C.J. Leno's Garage. I was with uh, Chris Carter. Yeah, uh, I have a picture of it. Pro. Yeah, I have a picture of it here on the slideshow, yeah. Okay, well, Chris, was. Uh, we, were, we had breakfast one morning with Pedro Arruja. Uh, he's the owner of, of Polysport. And this is what class Pedro is, of Polysport is. Pedro invited Preston to fly to, uh, to Portugal to come see their facility, but Preston's health did not allow for that. So Pedro, as busy as a man that he is traveling all over the world, he flew to uh, to L.A., met me, met Ken Smith, and we did. Uh, we, we and we were with Chris Carter. We were with Brad Lackey. Uh, Brad wasn't in that photo. He'd already headed home. Uh, but but um, uh, gosh, I forget where I was going with that again, Joe. I'm sorry. I get all no, all, no, that's okay. We, you. <laughs> no, no, we 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 were with uh, we were with Preston Petty, the type of man he was, and how he's in the cockpit of the Concord, and then the guy from Polysport. Okay. Yep. Well. Well. It, it, that morning, we were all sitting across. Chris Carter was there. Peter Starr was there, and um, and we were sitting across the the breakfast table at Big Jim's restaurant, and uh, right down the street from Leno's Garage, having breakfast. And I asked Preston a question. I said, "Hey, Press. I said, is it true that in the late '60s, maybe very early '70s, there were two two guys that because Preston was big, big, big in the computers, mm -hmm. uh, really big in the computers, and, and knew them inside and out, and still does." But uh, there were two guys, young guys, that approached them, college guys, about this computer that they, they could fit in a suitcase <laughs> and, uh, and be portable. And I said, is that, is that story true? Did they actually come to you? 
and uh, Steve Jobs. Yeah. And uh, he said, he said, yeah. He said it looked kind of hokey. I didn't think it was ever going to work. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's. Uh, uh, there's, there's so there's so many great Preston stories, and, yeah. and and it's just, you know, Joe, we've been around together a long time, you and I, and, yeah. and just the friends that we share. Uh, the, the motor, you asked me about the motorcycle thing, and, and did, did I dream about it? Um, as a kid, no, not necessarily, but I do have to say this: that my wife and I, the best people that we've met in our lives, uh, that would do anything for us. Are all motorcycle people? Hands They're down. all motorcycle affiliated. Oh yeah. And uh, they're the most honest, decent, hardworking, caring people. And uh, if it wasn't for the motorcycles, I think our lives would be pretty empty, Joe. I I agree. My guest this morning has been Paul Standard. Paul, I want to thank you once again for uh, your sponsorship for Vintage Motocross Q and A, for all you do for the vintage motocross community, for the Preston Petty things, for all you did with Strictly Hodaka and. Uh, and all the things you're still doing for us, Paul. So thank you very well, much. Joe, I, I, I want to thank you, Joe, for what you're doing. You're such a great, positive vibe for our sport that we love, Joe. Oh. I, I love tuning in. I love seeing what you're doing. You're providing a great service. And, Joe, we've known each other a long time. You're just a fantastic guy, too. It's, thank you. It's just, it's, it's just like talking to Leno. It's just like talking to an old friend. Yeah, great, you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> thank you so much, Paul. And uh, regards to Patty and the kids. All right, and you tell Susie we said hello to and send our love, okay? Will do, Paul. Okay. Thank Thanks you so down. much. Bye. Bye-bye. My guest this morning has been Paul Standard. Some great stories about Preston Petty, how the Fenders came about his days at Strictly Hodaka, and so much more. Once again, I want to thank our sponsors, Preston Petty Products, The Legend Continues, Vintco, Keep the Ride Going, Motion Pro, for all your specialized tools, controls, and cable needs. Mark Hildebrand and Nightmare Racing, a dear friend and makes the best Kawasaki plastic on the planet. Russell Waters and Amsoil, the first in synthetic oil since 1973. Tom McAllister, Full Circle Racing, your one-stop shop for spokes, rims, lacing, truing, and hub restoration. And of course, Fortuna Sausage and Italian Market. Fine Italian delicacies delivered right to your door. This is Joe Body. Please join me on Wednesday night for Vintage Motocross Q&A. And by then, I should have... Uh, well, I hope I have a guest for next Sunday. Till I speak to you again, have a blessed week, everyone. Enjoy your Labor Day. Have a great one. Thanks for joining us today.